Good to see everybody today. Uh, let me give you a little bit of backstory to where this topic came from. Uh, Steve mentioned that I spent a lot of a lot of time at Adobe uh, leading an agile transformation there, and I uh, moved a couple of years ago and found all my adult old Adobe stuff, like the actual name badge there. And uh, it was fun coming across this. Uh, in my early years at Adobe, uh, I spent a lot of time focused on uh, Agile for product teams. So I was the program manager in the mid 2000s for Adobe's audio products, Audition, Soundbooth, some other products. And uh, our team was one of the first teams at Adobe to adopt Scrum in 2005. And uh, eventually that led to me kind of sharing what we were up to with other product teams and, and that became a full-time job. Uh, so in the early years of that job, it was really about helping teams adopt an agile approach. And there were lots of system constraints to the way that teams worked. Uh, most teams weren't really strictly cross-functional yet and weren't doing very rapid iteration on their products because Adobe was set up with these long kind of two-year product cycles. So there were some really traditional software development things going on. And uh, adopting an agile approach at the team level was uh, a big undertaking for a lot of us. So when we would adopt these Agile approaches, uh, we saw some pretty strong quick wins working with those teams. And like the promise of Agile seemed really strong. We would have continuous improvement and better products and happier customers and more engaged teams. And uh, those seemed like initially like uh, we would make these really quick gains. And like we were on our way to Nirvana, like Agile Nirvana was coming. Um, and teams would be cruising along in their agileness, thinking, wow, we're on the road to some cool stuff here. Uh, and then a common pattern would happen on that road where a few months or maybe even a year or two in, the teams would start kind of working out all of the internal constraints. Like if you're familiar with theory of constraints, we would address the constraints that were within the team. And then suddenly the improvement needs would shift to outside of the team. And then our nice, smooth highway to agile happiness uh, would like suddenly turn into uh, like a bumpy dirt road. Like, wait, where did, where did the pavement go? Uh, and as soon as the constraint shifted outside of the team, things kind of broke down. And so there were a couple of questions related to that. Number one, what was going on there? What is slowing us down? How come this agile stuff that was working really well at the team level wasn't really working well outside of it. Uh, and then a, a second question that often came up, even as we were doing the team level adoption, is that as we would start to structure into these agile teams, uh, people with management roles would often say, well, hang on, if, if we're doing this like kind of self-organization thing within the team, then what's my role? And early on, I didn't really have any answer for that question, but people were asking me because I was viewed as kind of like, well, this is the transformation person. Uh, they must know these things, but as any folks uh, that are working on agile transformations know, those things aren't really predictable or knowable. Otherwise, we could just give you a nice roadmap. Uh, so I started exploring that question of uh, what is the role of management in an agile organization? Now, initially, uh, I, I would look to you know blogs and websites and articles and and I did come across a lot of people trying to answer that question, but a lot of the answers were not super satisfying to me. Like sometimes the answers were super fuzzy and vague. It's like, oh, the role of management in an agile organization, uh, you just need to switch to being servant leaders. That, that's your role now. And uh, I actually think there's some truth to that, but uh, giving managers the advice to just be a servant leader uh, is very fuzzy. It's not a very concrete answer to that. Uh, sometimes the answers I received were seemed accurate, but a little bit incomplete. Like, oh, the role of management is now just to remove impediments for the team. And I, I think that's true as well. But I also think that that's an uh, incomplete description of the role of management. Sometimes uh, I would come across answers that to me were uh, just plain wrong, at least plain wrong as universal answers to this question. Like, oh, uh, uh, management doesn't exist if you adopt an agile approach. We get rid of all the managers. Uh, and 
uh, I had been involved in organizations that were very agile and still had good management functions in them. So I knew that this wasn't necessarily the case, at least not universally. So fuzzy, incomplete, and at least wrong in most cases answers didn't seem that helpful to me. So I started working on the problem myself to see if I could figure something out that made sense to me and felt like a useful answer to those managers um, who were like to a person, awesome people and really wanted to do the right thing to help their teams. And so as I've studied this and iterated on it with now dozens of different organizations, I have uncovered uh, covered some patterns that seem to work reliably. And that's what I'm gonna share today. Uh, but I want to kind of give you the backstory of where those came from. Uh, essentially, what we've landed on and where we're going to end up today is that there, I think, are just three big jobs of management. So we can summarize the role of managers in an agile organization with those three things. Um, and then for those three things, I've learned that there are really two lenses that we can look at each of those jobs through. Uh, and those are like different ways to focus on those three jobs. So before we dig into the details of that model, I want to share uh, how I got there, uh, because I think there are some important details about that that are uh, emerge as we tell the story. So one of the first things I looked at when I was trying to help managers understand what does agile management look like was this awesome book I came across a book by uh, a naval submarine commander there pictured on the left, uh, Commander David Marquet. Marquet wrote this book called Turn the Ship Around. And the, the book is one of the best pieces of creative nonfiction writing I've ever come across. So if you like those kind of books, they're, they're true stories, but they're really well written. Highly recommend this book. Uh, Marquet took over command of a, a naval sub uh, when he was promoted to captain that submarine was the worst performing ship in the Navy at the time. Uh, and he had a complete turnaround on that ship, kind of driven by some crises that were happening uh, when he first took over. Uh, the end of the story, though, is that that's uh, for anybody that recognizes a, a Utah resident there, uh, uh, former Utah resident, I guess, Stephen Covey. So that's Stephen Covey on the uh, SS Santa Fe with David Marquet and, and Covey toured the ship at the end of Marquet's tenure there and reported that the, the Santa Fe at that point was the most engaged organization of any type he'd ever seen. And uh, so a huge turnaround, hence the name of the book. But what Marquet really did was uh, introduce this pattern of language um, in, that he was going to use himself and that he expected all uh, people in any kind of management role to use as well. The language pattern basically goes like this. Instead of issuing a command, uh, Marquet said, I want you to come to me if you report to me and say, Captain, I intend to do the following. So that, that kind of shifts things from me issuing a command to you coming to me and telling what you intend to do. And then uh, I'm going to ask you, uh, you know, what do you think I might be worried about as the captain of the ship if you did that thing? And so then you're going to have to convince me it's kind of the a safe thing to do that you've done your due diligence there. So I intend to submerge the ship is the example he gives in the book. And I've checked that everybody's below decks. I've checked that it's our water. I've checked that we have the right depth. That's the second thing. I've done the following due diligence. And then the third part of that language pattern that he introduced in his ship was here's how it aligns to our, our mission or our vision and strategy. Here's why it's the right thing to do. So I was really excited about this pattern because Marquet adopted that pattern due to a crisis. Uh, he had studied and uh, trained to take over the command of a different submarine, a submarine called the Olympia. And then two weeks before he took over command of it, uh, that captain decided to stay on for another term. So his only other option was to take over the Santa Fe, but it was a different cast, class of submarine. And it uh, turned out that uh, that submarine had some quirks in how it was built. And one of the first things Marquet was doing on that submarine was uh, some drills to get ready for an inspection. And one of the drills is where they shut down the nuclear reactor while they're cruising around and move to battery power and then see, all right, can the crew figure out what happened and fire up the nuclear reactor before we sink to the bottom of the ocean? That's the drill that he was running. So he was up on the bridge 
And apparently there's this chain of command that happens on a submarine on the bridge where the captain issues a command to the bridge commander. And the bridge commander passes that command onto the pilot and then the pilot executes it. And so they're out there tooling around and, and Marquet gives the, the command, hey, bridge commander, go ahead one third. And bridge commander says, pilot, ahead one third. And the pilot says, ahead one third, aye. And they start moving the, the boat forward. And then Marquet's looking around and, and he realizes, I don't know if people are, are sensing the urgency here. Let's ramp up the urgency a little bit. Let's go ahead two thirds. So he says, all right, bridge commander, ahead two thirds. And bridge commander says, uh, pilot, ahead two thirds. And the pilot kind of just sits there for a second with this dumbfounded look on his face. And Marquet says, pilot, did you hear the command to go ahead two thirds? And he said, aye, captain. And he said, uh, why are we not going ahead two thirds? And the pilot said, there is no ahead two thirds on this boat, captain. This boat has a head three fourths. And Marquet says, oh no, I studied for this other ship. Almost no ships have three fourths. This is one of those. I didn't even know it. I'm the captain of the ship and I got it wrong. And then he re realizes, hang on, the bridge commander passed the two thirds command on. And he says, bridge commander, did you know that there was no two thirds on the Santa Fe? The bridge commander said, of course, captain, I've been on this ship for five years. And he said, so why did you issue the command to the pilot to go ahead two thirds? He said, because you told me to, sir. He said, oh no, we're in trouble here. I don't understand this ship well enough because I studied the other one for two years. We've got to get ready to do this inspection. It's not safe for me to issue commands. And so they, they went to the boardroom, they talked it out. And basically they adopted this pattern in that meeting to say the only way for us to be safe is for the people that know how the ship works to say, here's what I intend to do. Here's the due diligence and here's how it's aligned with our mission. And Marquet said that they, they put this into place and within 24 hours, it felt like a different ship. That ship that was the worst performing ship in the Navy within a few years, it completely turned it around. So it's a really fun story. And I got really excited about this and I wrote a blog post about it. And I was like, this is what managers should be doing. Look at all this cool stuff. And then a friend of mine uh, commented on that post and said, oh, well, you're familiar with Dan Peake's drive, right? Which I was, but I hadn't made this connection. And he said, did you notice how those three things in this language pattern are directly tied to what Dan Pink summarized as the research around engagement? I intend to. This is all about autonomy. Here's what I think we should do. I've done the following due diligence as a chance to check on mastery. I said, ah, that's fantastic. And then the last one is here's how it aligns with our mission or vision is a, a alignment with purpose. So we said, this is fantastic. If we just use this language pattern, then we create engagement. It's no wonder that Stephen Covey thought this was such an engaged organization. So I would teach this to leaders in organizations as a way, uh, like a, a language pattern that they could use that would, that would drive engagement up. And one of the companies that I uh, taught this to is a company called Therospex. Now the CEO of Therospex, Therospex by the way, makes uh, precision tinted eyewear for people that have uh, headaches or migraines that are uh, triggered by certain light, types of light, fluorescent lights, flickering lights, those types of things. And um, the CEO of that company uh, came from a software background. So the CEO Hart really understood Agile, but wanted to try and use like Agile techniques in a company that really wasn't about product development. Like, they've got four types of lenses. This is a company that's not doing things that are in the complex domain. It's pretty ordered, predictable stuff. But Hart really wanted to see if, if uh, he can model some of these next generation ideas about how to lead a company, even in a complicated domain organization. If you're familiar with the Kinevin model, for example, uh, Kinevin sorts the, wor the world of problems into some different types. And most of the types that Hart was dealing with were complicated domain things where traditional management kind of works. It's not the most exciting place to work often, or it can, can uh, be low engagement, but you can churn out a lot of pairs of Therospecs and get them shipped. Hart wanted to do the next generation kind of agile organizational stuff in this domain and see if he could test it out. That was his goal. And so we, Hart attended a, a certified agile leadership course that I taught, uh, him and his COO, and they decided to adopt this model. They called it intent-based decision-making, where anybody at the organization could make any decision, like the, the intern that they just hired to help on the phones 
could decide to launch a new model of Therospex glasses as long as they use this model. I intend to do this. I've done the following due diligence. Here's how it's aligned with our vision. Uh, and, and they could get people's advice on it and then do it. So Hart was pretty fired up about this, and they adopted this as part of their company working agreement. Here's how we operate around here. Uh, about six months later, I was following up with Hart to see how things were going. And he said, it's interesting, Peter, like uh, it has sorted my employees into two categories, the people that will use it and the people that will never use it. Like there are some people that, that are fired up all the time. They're always using this intent-based approach. Uh, and then there are some people who just never do. I don't know what it is. I don't know why they don't use it. Um, and so Hart was Hart was puzzling over that. And as we talked through it, we said, you know, maybe it's just that like copying a practice from a completely different context doesn't exactly copy well if the context is different. Uh, so, so we started digging into like, okay, well, what's different about your company and a submarine? Well, obviously there are quite a few. What's different about your employees and, and the employees on a submarine? There are quite a few. So I'm going to come back to Therospecs in a minute, but uh, around the same time I was working with another company where we kind of had a breakthrough that helped us there. So I'm going to take a quick detour to Boston uh, to talk about a company called Isotope that makes uh, music and audio software. Uh, the CEO, one of my favorite CEOs of Isotope, uh, a guy named Mark Ethier. Mark wanted to transform his company uh, to where the teams doing the work were really, really autonomous. Uh, he said, it's not our job as managers or as executives to tell people what to do. We want to get out of that way of doing things and create empowered scrum teams. That's our goal. And we were working with Mark's leadership team on that. And I asked them a question, which is, um, what, what would cause you to trust the teams? Like, are there things that you could do? Are there things that you would need to do? in order to feel like you would always trust your scrum teams to make as good a decision as you would make if you were in their shoes, or maybe a better decision than you would make because they have more information than you do. Uh, and we had learned this model. Like we had also walked through the, the Marquet intent-based stuff with, uh, with Mark and his team. And as we worked through that model, we realized that Marquet was doing a few things with this model that might help them trust the team. Like the last item here, uh, here's how it aligns with our vision and strategy. We realized, oh, well, that gives Marquet as a leader a chance to check that there's clarity on what's important. So if, if we could figure out a way to ensure that there was always clarity on what's most important, then I would totally trust the teams to do the right thing within that, within that clarity. The, I've done the following due diligence ensures that there's uh, sufficient competence. Like, can a new hire do this? Can anybody do it? Well, if they have to explain the due diligence they've done, uh, we think we should build this new product or we think we should release on this date and we think it's the right thing to do because that allows, again, leadership who might have more experience in that area or might not to check, hey, do these people know what they're doing? Um, can we check on the level of competence there? Uh, and then the third thing uh, that Mark Hay talked about was he was able to give control. If, if he created clarity and competence for the organization, then he could give control. So this is even a frame that comes from Mark Hay in his book that he, he considers competence and clarity, the two pillars that allow management to give control to anybody. So we said, all right, it seems like those are the jobs. You, that's your job, Mark and leadership team, is to create clarity and increase competence, and, and then provide enough information that people can, can have the control that they need. Um, that was the, the one thing that Mark and his team were worried about. It's like, well, we just have so much information as the leaders because we're looking across teams. I think if we could do those three things though, create clarity, increase competence, and provide information, then we would, then we would trust the teams to do the right thing all the time. We hire well, we love our people. So let's try that. So we dug into it, this became like a filter uh, for their management team. Their management team wanted to operate as a scrum team as well. And so this was the filter, like uh, our backlog items as a leadership team need to do one of these three things or we should be delegating them to the scrum teams doing the, the work. 
Uh, and as we used that as a filter, we realized that there was one tweak we needed to make in order to make that actually true, that these were the only three things that the leadership team did. We realized that providing enough information, making information transparent, was actually just one instance of improving the system. And that the leadership team still had a role in improving the overall system of work to create more flow, to create uh, more trust across teams, things like that. So uh, these three ideas of these are the roles of leadership, we took those back to Hart at Therospex and we shared those with Hart. We said, hey, over at Isotope and with some other clients, we're working out this model where instead of just using intent-based language directly, we're making sure that leadership is creating clarity, that they're increasing the level of competence and that they're working on improving the system. And then everything else, we expect the, the individuals or teams to be working on. And, and Hart looked at it and about 10 seconds later said, I love it except it's not just competence, it's capability. Because he said, one of my jobs as CEO, his is a very small company compared to Mark's. One of my jobs as CEO is like to secure funding for the company. I don't expect that the, the newly hired customer service agent should have to go secure funding for the company. So I consider that my responsibility. So I think increasing the, oh, the, the overall level of capability, including individual and team competence, but other things like that, are, uh, I would agree with these. And so this is kind of where we landed as Hart applied these, he started to realize, okay, this is super helpful. Uh, I can see creating greater alignment and I can see creating greater capability and improving the system as what I focus on and everything else. I encourage team members to, to do that. So I wanna give you a few uses of this model. I'm gonna keep elaborating on the model a little bit, but the first use of the model started pop up right away, uh, which was around responsibilities. Uh, so I'm gonna give you an example of using this model to help a product owner understand what their role is compared to other management or stakeholders roles. Because if you look at creating clarity, that's also the job of a product owner, like what's most important. And so let's take a look at uh, this model and see how it might help us. So. If we were to take this example of creating clarity and there's the team role of the product owner there, and maybe you're an organization that has some management as well. And, oh, look, here's another one. Like uh, Scrum Master's job is to improve the system, right? And well, what about that? Doesn't a Scrum Master sort of increase capability on the human side of things? So there might be some confusion on, well, what is the role of management then? if the scrum team is doing these things. And so one way that we've used this with teams is just to say within those three areas, let's pick one of them and say around the create clarity area. What are the things that people do to create clarity? Well, uh, maybe a pur purpose or mission statement. Uh, maybe we create a compelling vision. Maybe we do things like customer segmentation and research. Maybe we set strategic objectives. Uh, we do things like prioritize and refine the product backlog. And if those are all the things that we do to create clarity for a team, uh, let's agree on who's responsible for which of those items. Uh, in some organizations that we work with, they might divide it up this way. They say, you know, management's sort of in charge of all that stuff. And the product owner's in charge of doing the backlog. But we might also say the more responsibility we can give to the product owner, the more effective they can be at their job and the more empowered the team's gonna feel. So maybe we can set a goal to start to move these other things over to the product owner. Maybe product owners could be responsible for more things and maybe we collaborate on vision and purpose and mission. So one of the ways that we've used this is when there is a lack of clarity about roles, we can create clarity around roles, not just around what to build, but around roles by using these, these three areas. We could do the same thing with a scrum master. What is the scrum master responsible for improving in the system and what do other people in the organization uh, do to improve the system? That way we don't feel like we're battling over the same um, role and responsibility questions. So that's one of the uses we've seen for this model that's been really helpful. Um, wanna go back to the conversation I was having with Hart now around Therospex. Uh, around these ideas of create clarity, increase capability, improve the system. And Hart said, if you were to give a presentation around this, Hart knows me well, uh, if you were to give a presentation around this, 
what companies would you use as amazing examples of doing this well? So I started to think through that. Like, what examples would I share? Who's amazing at creating clarity? And the first company that popped in my mind for that was Tesla. I thought, wow, Tesla is, uh, if, you, if you look at Elon Musk's writing, like in 2006, in fact, this might be a fun post to look up. Uh, in 2006, Tesla had just announced the Roadster. So they had their big, you know, Musk comes out on stage, they drive the Roadster out. Uh, and they started that, um, that big announcement meeting by sharing the mission of Tesla Motors, which is an example of creating clarity. Musk said, the mission of Tesla Motors is to accelerate the mass market adoption of sustainable transportation. And then he rolled out this really expensive two seat sports car. And he said, our goal is to have a production run of about 4,000 of these. It's gonna cost over $100,000 to buy. And so somebody appropriately probably tweeted at Elon Musk, like, hey, Elon, way to, way to go mass market sustainable transportation with your two seat sports car that 4,000 rich guys are gonna be able to afford. So kind of being critical of whether the Roadster really was uh, uh, moving that company towards that mission statement. And Musk responded to that tweet by writing an article called The Super Secret Master Plan of Tesla Motors Just Between You and Me, where he laid out the strategy of the company for the next 10 years. And he laid it out surprisingly accurately. Uh, if you go back and read that article from 2006, he talks about how they're going to roll out this car and then they're going to use the funds and the buzz they get from the Roadster to fund their next car, which will be a family size sedan. And uh, we'll target um, a little bit down market, still high end, but BMW, Mercedes, Audi owners, we're going to go after that market. And that'll be the first one that we design in house. And we're going to build out our manufacturing capability with that one. And then we're going to use the funds from that one to fund the third car. And the third car that we build, uh, that one will be one that uh, goes after Toyotas and Hondas. And when that car is successful, then we'll be at mass market adoption. So it's all part of this super secret master plan. It's very rare for a company to be public about their strategy, but Musk was, and he was right on with it. And so I thought, ah, Tesla's a great example of creating clarity in the organization. Uh, in fact, the mission is so clear at Tesla that I remember reading uh, some articles a couple years back, they had a big round of layoffs. Like they laid off like 10% of their workforce. And so all of the articles are looking for the disgruntled employee to explain what's, what, you know, what's it really like inside Tesla. Uh, a little bit of sour grapes often in those articles or, or just trying to drudge up the, you know, the negative stuff as uh, media sometimes does. And, uh, I read two or three articles where they said, we, in, we interviewed four people that were laid off and none of them would speak bad about the company. They all talked about how, yeah, it was a hard place to work. Uh, they worked us really hard, but I totally, totally was on board because the mission is so important to me. That's evidence that Musk did a great job of creating clarity on why. Why are we doing this work and what are we doing next? So I said, Tesla knocked it out of the park on creating clarity. Increased capability. Uh, the, the company that came to mind is a company called Bridgewater Associates. Bridgewater Associates for many years has been the most successful hedge fund company in the world. Um, it's talked about in a book called, I first learned about it in a book called An Everyone Culture uh, by Robert Keegan. And An Everyone Culture is a book that studies companies who are what Keegan calls deliberately developmental organizations. And the way he describes that is these are organizations that see individual growth of the employee as equally important and supporting business growth. Like the more aware I am, the more capable I am as an individual, the more successful the business is because I make better decisions and I'm better at collaborating and, and Bridgewater Associates. Uh, and so I learned about the company there. And then the CEO of that company ended up writing a book called Principles. Both of those books are, again, I'll put on my highly recommended list, uh, Principles by Ray Dalio. Really fascinating book. And Bridgewater uh, took this idea of, of growth and development and increasing capability as far as I think is humanly possible. For example, 
uh, at Bridgewater, uh, they have an iPad app called the Dot Collector app. Here's how that app is used. Uh, everybody brings their iPads, carries them everywhere in the company. You go into a meeting and you sit down. And for that meeting, the Dot Collector app pops up and everybody that's attending the meeting pops up as uh, rows, like in a spreadsheet. The column headers are strengths. And during the meeting, what you're expected to do is give people live feedback on how they're showing up on these important areas of uh, growth and strength. And so including the CEO, and so Dalio has given, like I've seen video of this, of him looking at the iPad while he's giving a presentation in a company meeting and people saying, uh, brevity, red, you're rambling on, move on, like giving him prompts in the meeting, live meeting. So taking it about as far, and then, and then over time you collect what they call your baseball card. Like here are your real strengths. People consistently rate you high at this. Here are your weaknesses. People consistently rate you low at this. You need to find ways to compensate for those, hire around them, be more aware of them. Fascinating, right? And I don't know if I'd want to work there. Like people know, people in the hedge fund industry know about uh, Bridgewater and it's a big filter about whether you get in or out. Uh, but talk about focused on increased capability. Uh, Dalio says that's the reason why we make better decisions than anyone else because we can talk about our personal stuff and we don't get as drawn into our biases around that. So there's an example of that. And then uh, an example of improve the system that everybody on this call is probably familiar with is kind of the Toyota production system, the origin of lean thinking and Kaizen and continuous improvement, really focused on that. And Hart said, well, those are good examples. Would you consider those, all three of those, um, companies that others should aspire to become like? I said, ooh, that's a good question. Maybe parts of what they do we should aspire to, like. Tesla's ability to create clarity. But then again, Tesla also tends to burn their people pretty hard. So I don't know if I would say you should be like Tesla. Bridgewater, may, maybe like uh, if you're really into personal development and, and up for that kind of growth journey, then yeah, maybe you should found a company like that, but maybe not. Toyota, fantastic continuous improvement. Um, I don't know. Is it an agile organization? It's, it's the leanest organization in the world, probably. Is it agile? I don't know. Uh, and so I started to think about this, like, what is it that I wouldn't recommend in these? Why wouldn't I recommend them? And as I, as I pondered that, like kind of another lens on this model started to emerge. Uh, that we could look at each of these jobs of management with two lenses. There's kind of the objective lens, like how systems work, how structures fit together, uh, how we deliver on business results kind of the concrete parts of a business. But there's also a human side to each of these. Uh, and where I was hesitant to recommend a company, uh, what I discovered was that they were um, particularly weak on one lens on one of these things. And so maybe they're not the end all be all of organizations. They're, but they are really good at at least one part of this system. So let me walk you through those and then I'll show you an example of how that works, right? Um, if we look at each of these as having those two sides. So let's start with create clarity. What does it mean to do that objectively versus on the human side? Uh, if we look at on the human side of create clarity, uh, we're creating clarity of how we make a positive social impact for employees, customers, the broader community. It's actually something that Tesla does well. Like we're making an impact on the earth, right? And, uh, but they might not do a good job of uh, showing how your life individually as an employee is going to be a lot better by working for Tesla. It's really about the, the bigger impact that you're having. On the objective side, creating clarity is about what's most important. What are the business priorities? What are the strategic steps we'll take to get there, right? So human side of clarity, objective side. Uh, let's look at that for increasing capability. On the human side, our capability to grow personally, to develop leadership skills, to, to be more effective at collaborating with other human beings to solve important problems. Uh, that's an area of growth for all of us. It's an important area to focus on uh, for leadership and manage, excuse me, management. On the objective side, are we growing our individual and collective technical skills? Uh, are we acquiring and using effectively the resources we need in order to be successful? So kind of a human side and objective side to increasing 
uh, capability as well. And then finally, on that third job around improving the system, uh, are we improving the system so that people are volunteering their creativity and energy to solve problems? Are we creating psychological safety, uh, kind of the cultural aspects of the system? On the objective side, do we have greater flow and ease in delivering value to our customers, right? And so we can look at each of these three things, these three jobs through each of those lenses. And it gives us, I think, a more balanced perspective of what do organizations need to be aware of when they're trying to manage effectively. And this led to uh, another use of the model, which is to use the two jobs, uh, excuse me, the three jobs and the two sides to identify areas that might be out of balance. So if we were to fully from an outsider point of view, I've never worked there. I only know one person that, that has worked there and they didn't work there very long. So totally outsider view, this could be way off base. But if I were to evaluate these from a clarity standpoint, objectively, Tesla, fantastic. Uh, clear strategy, clear priorities of what's most important to do next. On the human side, very, very strong at creating clarity around why the work matters, what, what uh, we're what we're trying to do in the world and why that's important. Maybe not so strong on uh, what's in it for you individually, uh, like what, what growth path is here for you. Uh, not as much a focus there. On capability side, again, uh, Tesla very strong at, at building out new processes, at acquiring uh, um, investments, at... Uh, <laughs> It depends on uh, your ethics around acquiring investments, but, um, but at, at acquiring the resources necessary to be successful, acquiring other companies. Like I remember when Tesla bought out the major factory automation company that was doing factory automation for like Audi and, and Mercedes, I think. Uh, they acquired the capability. I, I don't know that I've ever heard discussion of how Tesla approaches personal and leadership development. And so from an outsider perspective, we might rate that a little bit lower than some of the other ones. And then similarly on a system side, uh, Tesla very focused on creating uh, lean systems within their, um, their manufacturing capability. Uh, very innovative on things like how you sell a car, the systems to generate value. Uh, and again, I'm not as, as aware of them focusing so much on how do we create psychologically psychological safety and engagement within the organization. So again, total outsider view could be way off, but helpful for us to look at companies and to say, how might, how might we look at this from the outside? If you're maybe, if you're interviewing for a company, look at all six of these and say, you know, does this have the right mix for me here? Uh, if I were to take a more insider view, like uh, for many years, I was working at a company called Agile for All, and we used this model to say, how do we do on these? six different areas, the three jobs through the two lenses. We said, from a clarity standpoint, uh, very strong on why we exist as a company. Uh, we really want to make a difference in, in organizations and individuals' um, ability to really be agile. From a strategic standpoint, not nearly as strong. What, are, what strategic steps are we taking? Well, because of how our company was structured at the time, kind of uh, uh, individuals that... Um, had a lot of autonomy, which is what it was built for, uh, that made it difficult for us to collaborate around things like strategy. So not as strong there. Uh, from a capability standpoint, high level of technical capability, high level of uh, technical competence, uh, challenged, we were challenged to figure out how to collaborate more effectively. So on the human side of that one, a little bit weaker. And then finally, on things like the system, uh, everybody at our company loved everybody else at our company. <laughs> we were really good at those types of things, high psychological safety, but not always good at creating systems to be more efficient at delivering value. So we can use this internally as well to say, how are we doing uh, as an organization? And, and this was company-wide. You could certainly do this team-wide as well. So that's the second use that we've come across. All right, I want to share another example uh, from another company we work with. This is a company called Geonetric. And uh, this was really interesting because Geonetric has been a longtime client of ours. But Geonetric, several years ago, is one of those companies that decided to get rid of managers. They said, this scrum thing is working well at the team level. We're going to do away with any job that says manager. And everybody's going to organize into, into scrum teams. Uh, and, and so now that's a company that is, is completely self-organizing. 
And so I was talking to Linda, the CEO of that company, and I was talking to her about this model we were developing and asking her, I don't know, would this, does this model make sense to you? You don't have anybody with the job of manager. So let me walk you through what it is and give me your thoughts on it. And so uh, we said, here's what the model looks like. And what do you do in these? And she said, well, we still need to talk about purpose and vision. Like that still needs to exist. Now we do that in a different way than most organizations where we're co-creating that. And we're using facilitated techniques to agree on a purpose and vision. Uh, we still need to create clarity around what values are here. What are our values? And again, we do that in a very collaborative way. Uh, but these are things that we do. Uh, we have things like um, decide who our customers are. These are the things that are challenging for us in a self-managing model. Uh, because one team might want to go after this customer, or another team might go after that customer, and we have to talk about that. And that kind of spans the left side, right side. Uh, setting objectives is a challenge for us sometimes uh, in a self-managing way, same with strategy. And we started to talk about more and more examples within the model, which I'll, I'll, I'll give you a better picture of here in a moment. But as I talked through these things with Linda, we started to get more details on these things. And that allowed us to talk about another way to use the model. And here's how we used it with Linda. Uh, Linda had uh, a, a friend of hers come to her uh, that uh, was a 17 person organization, kind of a startup, growing startup. And uh, she had come to Linda as kind of a mentor saying, Linda, we're really struggling as a company, we, we, we use Scrum at our startup. There are 17 of us, and we're all on one team right now. Uh, and our Scrum master is concerned that for some reason, the standup is taking too long. Now, all of us on the call might say, well, 17 people, too many for a Scrum team, right? That's like the obvious answer. Um, and uh, as, as Linda looked at this model, she said, ah, when I talked to my friend, I actually brought this model up because we had just talked through it and, and I had like a better, a better visualization of it by that point, which I'll share later, uh, that had all these different aspects, kind of areas to focus. And uh, what she did was realize that just talking about one of these areas, like you might expect that in the system, uh, maybe we should talk about uh, collaboration structures, uh, how we coordinate, meet and interact because your, your team is too big. <laughs> Uh, 17 is too big to have an effective daily scrum, probably for most situations. So how we organize in team and then how that team coordinates. But she said, as we walked through the model, we realized that people structures wasn't really the problem because they got into, well, let's just split the team. And then the question was, so how should we split the team? And what it turned out was that there were two competing ideas for what this company should do. What's the purpose and vision for the company? And uh, since they couldn't decide, they just decided to do it all. Like there were, we could, we could pursue this path or we could pursue that path. They had two kind of strategic opportunities and they were not aligned on which of those were the right thing to do. So anytime they talked about splitting the team, if they were to pick path A, that implied one way to split the teams. But if, it if they picked path B, that implied a different way to split the teams. So they could never agree on that. And so the team structures was just a symptom of this bigger thing that we haven't aligned on the purpose and vision of this company. Where are we going? Uh, and so that having the, the broader model there allowed them to see more options for where to focus and actually to get into the root cause of that. And so then they had, a, the, they had the hard, uh, contentious, and really important discussion about where are we going as a company. And once they resolved that, then the right team structure emerged from it. So it allowed, the way that Linda described it is having this model allowed her to see more options when we're trying to dig into to fixing impediments like that. One other use of this that I'll share right here is uh, as we've worked with organizations that are interested in adopting an agile approach or doing some transformation, uh, having that, that uh, full model to look at allows us to prioritize where do we start in the transformation. And so this would be an example where we have uh, everybody kind of vote what of all these different focus areas, what's the weakest right now, what's the strongest right now with red and green. Um, and then we look for where there's some clusters of dots. And in this example of it right here, maybe the clusters of dots around the, uh, um, the system 
objective side down there imply that we should start with our transformation focus over there. So it allows us to kind of get a high level picture and we might pull out the one with the most dots and say, all right, it looks like workflow, how we divide and do the work is the biggest challenge right now. Let's figure out some experiments uh, to start our transformation that, uh, that play with how we do workflow right now. And then as, we, as we've done that, we've found that there are some, some uh, agile ways to do workflow and some less agile ways to do workflow. And, and for all of these, that's the case. Like we, we should probably be pushing authority to the work, not the other way around. We should probably be aware of complex systems and how we do workflow. Should probably create safety engagement as we're doing that. Uh, so that's, that's the fourth use that we've seen of this model uh, is, uh, to, uh, to kind of evaluate where should we start if we're gonna pick an impediment. Uh, teams can even do this uh, at the team level. Uh, it doesn't need to be organization wide. Uh, you could use this as a retrospective frame uh, and say, well, let's, let's rate our team on these various areas, what's strong and what's weak right here and, uh, and see, what, see what emerges from that. All right all interesting stuff around management, but what if I'm not a manager? Uh, this idea of management is uh, something I've dug into quite a bit over the years. Um, when you look like at dictionary definitions of that term, management, what is that? Uh, one of the dictionary definitions that I came up with or that I came across is that management is an attempt to exert control over the world. <laughs> if you think about that. And, and there's a paradox there, uh, which is that the things that we usually try and focus on controlling in our lives are not controllable. Like I wanna control other people's opinions of me. I wanna control how other people are gonna vote, <laughs> to put it into today's uh, terms. Uh, I wanna control other people's actions. And uh, I wanna control my health. I wanna control the health of my loved ones. So the things that are, are, are actually not controllable seem to be things that we focus on trying to control a lot. And the things that are controllable, we often look like our own beliefs, our own habits, our own choices. And so one way to think about management is trying to control things. And uh, the, the advice I would give here is to try and focus on things that you can actually control. So how are you creating greater clarity, increasing your capability, improving your own personal systems? And you can look at that through this lens uh, that I first learned about from Gloria Oyang, who's the head of the Human Systems Dynamics Inst Institute, HSD. Uh, and Gloria said that we can look at any challenge through three lenses. Uh, some challenges, we really own it. Like, I could just do it. You can look at this individually as a team. The team could just do it. We could own it. We could make the decision. We don't need permission. Uh, we don't even need to let anybody else know that we're choosing to manage this better. So what are the, th what are the things that you could really own uh, around creating gl greater clarity for your own work in your own life? What are the things you could really own as far as increasing capability, human side, objective side? And what are things that you could own in improving your own personal systems for how you get things done? So this is a, a, another use of the model is to say, well, if those are things that we manage, how am I doing on that for myself? And to start there. Uh, the next level out from here in Gloria's model is what are things that I can influence? Maybe I don't own them, but I can, I can have some influence on those things. Uh, so how do I influence where things are less clear? I'll give you one example of one of my favorite techniques for that. Uh, I was working with a product owner once and the product owner said, I strongly believe that strategically we should do X. But the product management group that I work with continually says, no, we should do Y. I think, but I can't get them to nail it down. And I keep asking them, what is it the thing that you think we should, you just keep telling me no to my thing, but I'm only guessing at what you think we should do instead. And so what that product owner ended up doing was uh, writing down what he thought their priorities were. So he came up with a list of what he thought their stakeholders' priorities were. And he scheduled a meeting. And he said, as far as I can tell, these are your priorities, one, two, three, four, five, and here are mine, and, and we're in conflict on those. Uh, is this correct? And that, because he made it concrete, he made it objective, 
uh, gave them something to respond to. And they immediately said, oh, no, that's not it. It's not one, two, three, four, five. You need to switch these two and that two. And now that's what we think. Uh, so that's an example of influence uh, around greater clarity. He didn't have clarity as a product owner over what the organization thought was most important. Uh, he didn't really own that because those stakeholders had more political authority in that organization than he did. Uh, he had to respond to it, but but uh, he could influence it. So that's an example of how do we influence where things aren't clear? Um, how do you in influence, how might you influence uh, increasing capability in the organization? Again, if you can make things visible, that's often a great way to do it. And then finally, how can you influence improving uh, systems of work? And at the end of the day, there are always going to be some things that we just need to respond to. Maybe we can't change the company vision or we can't change the company values. But I love how um, I, I love how Gloria says that we get to choose how to respond. Like we can choose to respond by grumbling and complaining about how the, everything sucks here, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> or we can choose to say, that's the way it is here. And uh, I'm going to choose to make the best of it. Uh, or you could choose to respond by saying, I don't know if I love working here anymore. Uh, maybe I'll see if there are other options out there in the world uh, and, and starting to explore that. That's another choice for how to respond. So uh, if you're familiar with Christopher Avery's responsibility process, uh, that, that's a great way to think through these things. Like, can I get to full responsibility in being a participant in this organization, even if I disagree with some of the choices that, that they're making? Uh, so within this model, those are some options that you have uh, is, is to think about what you own, what you influence, and what you, re and what you just need to choose how to respond to, right? Uh, so kind of summarizing that, uh, the best way to influence that I've ever seen is be amazing at managing yourself. That goes at the individual level and at the team level. Uh, in almost every case where we've seen Agile really take off in an organization, it's because one team tried it and did it really well and started to uh, prove that it would work there uh, in, in ways that nobody could really doubt. So be, you can influence by owning really well. So be amazing at managing yourself. Um, share some, some of these ideas with your team. Share them with your boss. Share them with your organization. Uh, and and uh, that's another way to influence, to say, hey, have we ever looked at the role of management through these lenses? Um, I've got uh, slides and a PDF of the model. If, if you'd like me to me email those to you, because I know that some of these things were pretty small. I struggle on in PowerPoint trying to get these large enough with that complex of a model. I'm happy to email those to you. Uh, that's my email address there. So with that, uh, I'm, I'm going to pause and uh, stop sharing and we'll open it up for questions. And I recognize that we're coming up on the hour. So if you're on your lunch break, if you got to drop off, totally get it. Appreciate you coming. I've got one, Peter. Awesome. Go for it. Uh, I work at Fidelity and uh, we are implementing Scrum and uh, managers have turned into chapter leads, kind of like a Spotify model. So mm -hmm. on paper, we've been told, oh, they're kind of, uh, you know, they're just in, in charge of like talent management. They're responsible for recruiting and you know they're so they're they're distanced from the delivery of software processing so mm -hmm. that has been a challenge for us because we take these people who are dev managers and all of a sudden they're not doing what they do best right um, yeah. but anyway i really liked your model and i was wondering uh how you think it relates to agile coaches because i see a lot of overlap between what coaches do and improving the system and uh your model yeah i think uh Agile coach is a word that is so polysemic now. Oh, by the way, that's my vocabulary word of the day. Polysemic is a word that means many things to many people. So I, I kept I kept saying that's a word like uh, uh, you keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. But it turns out that uh, everybody has their own definition of what an agile coach is, just like everybody has their own definition of what management or leadership means. So I said, there's got to be a word that means means different things. And it turns out polysemic. So that's my vocab word of the day. Um, 
uh, an agile coach is one of those terms. And I would think of it through the, you know, I gave that example earlier in the presentation of using the model to decide on roles and responsibilities. So what does agile coach really mean at your organization? Are you just focused on that third thing around improving the system? Or are Agile coaches responsible also for increasing capability? Are they responsible for creating greater clarity? Uh, and so I would, I would get clear on what is the job definition? Are we aligned on that? And where are the boundaries? I think a lot of the things around Agile coaches, Scrum Masters, all of these roles really is like, where, uh, do we agree on where I have responsibility for something and where you have responsibility for something? Where's that line? And, and how do we get clear on that? So I would use it that way for agile coaches in the same way I would use it for the product owner example I shared uh, earlier, where we pull up all these things and we say, I think agile coaches are responsible for these 12 boxes. Where would you draw the boxes? Are they these 12 or are they a different set? And let's see if we can line on it. So in a lot of ways, this, this model has just made, um, made it easier to visualize things like that for organizations. Uh, Cause I could see potentially agile coaches playing in in uh, increased capability, playing in for sure, improve the system. And in some cases, um, playing in the increased clarity if they're kind of facilitating sessions around vision, values, strategy, things like that. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, Dallas, thank you. Um, I have a question. So I really love your model of having the organization sit and discover roles and responsibilities. And I think that's, a really good exercise for us. We've sort of shifted so that our engineering managers are accountable for what the team is delivering. Uh, so we're right now having a little bit of friction between our scrum masters and our engineering managers. And so that's a really great uh, thing to do is to say, hey, let's circle the places that we each clearly own. And then let's talk about the places where there might be some overlap and decide what we wanna do there. But um, beyond doing that, and I know this is a hard question because you talked also about context and how that changes, but I would really love to hear what are some models that you've seen where you see that relationship working really well or where if an engineering manager steps back, you know, what does the team do to have to step up to be more accountable or any specifics that you uh, mm -hmm. could give of just different ideas. I'm, I'm just trying to think through this and any, yeah. any other texture you can add would be helpful. Um, here's another potential layer on it. And that's to look at this through the lens of uh, Bill Joyner's model called leadership agility. I don't know if anyone on the call is familiar with Bill. Uh, Bill, uh, Bill was doing research. Uh, he was a Harvard PhD. And he was doing research on stages of adult development, specifically with uh, like, seems like different leaders really see the world fundamentally different. Like there are, there are levels of that. Uh, and so he started applying uh, the techniques that people like Robert Keegan, who I mentioned earlier, uh, who were studying how individuals grow, just like children go through phases of development. Turns out adults can go through phases of development, it kind of requires growth mindset, right context, a lot of things. And so Bill applied that to what about leadership? And what he found is that there are three real distinct stages of leadership development, starting with what he called expert leadership, where I get promoted and I got promoted because I was really good at my job. And so I see the job as a leader, as sharing my expertise, my technical expertise with all those around me. And, and that's like the first stage of development. And that leads to a lot of things like kind of hub and spoke and that person being the constraint and the one person that's allowed to make decisions. And uh, there are different forms of it, but you've probably experienced that, right? Uh, leaders that have that view, like that's what good leadership looks like. I'm the expert. I know everything that's going on and I'll tell everybody what to do because I'm the best at it. And then he said, those leaders, that's by the way, 55% of everybody in a leadership role as he studied it. Uh, then he said, some leaders develop beyond that because there's a high energy cost to that for the leader themselves. It's just exhausting to have to know everything that's going on and to make all the decisions. And so we'll see uh, leaders getting just worn out with that and saying, there's got to be a better way and developing into what Bill calls achiever leaders. And now these are folks that are, are more trying to uh, uh, take a strategic stance, like here's what the team should be doing, and really delegating to the team how to accomplish those strategic objectives. And so it, like an OKR structure would be really fit with an achiever level of leadership. Like here's the objective, 
now you figure out the right key results and how you're going to meet that objective, uh, the way the OKRs were originally structured. Uh, and then there's a third level that he calls, that's, by the way, about 30% of leaders at that achiever level. Then the third level is what he calls catalyst leaders. And catalyst leaders are, are people who, um, it's, it's a level of development, uh, who are capable of, of having strong expertise, capable of, uh, of taking a strategic stance, but also are comfortable enough recognizing that the collective wisdom of the team is going to be far better than anything I could come up with. And so they try to catalyze good decisions. So it's a, just a completely different approach to decision making and structuring teams. And they, they do things like uh, build teams differently, lead change differently, like all of the things that we expect leaders to do effectively. They do it in a different way, in a more effective way, a more uh, engaging way. And so when you're describing what you're describing, I'm wondering if you're having a clash of two different expert style leaders, where I'm the expert in Scrum, and I'm the expert in the technology, and that's the clash. And, and maybe making that model transparent to them that there are other ways of leading that might allow us to figure out how to, how to collaborate more effectively might be helpful. Yeah, I love that. I've actually, actually, I heard you speak at the other conference and I wrote a little blog post for our leadership based on turn the ship around and some of your ideas. So I'm oh, doing awesome. my best. It's, a, it's an exhausting and exciting challenge. Um, and I don't get tired of talking about it because it's uh, just, you, you know, there's just a lot of different things you have to try. But thank you. I've really enjoyed listening to you again. Absolutely. Thank you, Eliza. I appreciate that. The quick answer is empathy. Uh, recognize that the change to an agile approach just messed that person's plans up. Uh, if I am a manager in an organization and I have, I've worked my way up into that role and I've worked hard to do that and I've tried to do good work. And because of that, I've gotten certain benefits. Like I get to make these kind of decisions and I get this kind of uh, recognition from the organization. And now we're gonna adopt this agile thing and all that goes away. Uh, I think my first advice would be, let's empathize with how that must feel. That sucks. Um, now, we might be able to say, well, yeah, but look how it's going to be so much better. So that might be true, but that doesn't matter to the person in the moment. Like psychologically, you just took away my toys. Uh, and so uh, I think uh, starting with trying to empathize with that, um, so that's the short answer. The long answer is that anytime we're, we're looking at a large change, like we're going to adopt Scrum, where we've used a more traditional stage gate or waterfall process in the past, uh, the resistance there, uh, I find helpful to look through the lens of Eli Goldratz. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Eli Goldratz. He wrote a book called The Goal. He's the father of a, a model called Theory of Constraints. And, and Eli had what he called the five layers of resistance. And at each layer, we can learn something different from the person that is giving us the resistance. Because the truth of the matter is nobody can make anybody do anything else. <laughs> um, and so that, that's kind of the harsh reality of resistance, as, as Dale Emery once said. That's the harsh reality of resistance is you can't make anyone change. The promising reality of resistance is that you can learn something. Maybe you learn something, maybe they learn something, maybe we both learn something uh, about the problem, about our solution. And at each of those levels of resistance, there's something for us to learn probably. So there are five of them. I'll really quick walk through. Uh, the first layer of resistance is at the problem. Like we don't even agree that there's a problem that Scrum is solving. Most of us uh, don't really think about the problem that Scrum is solving when we describe this solution. We just described the solution. Scrum's gonna be awesome because, not what problem are we trying to solve by adopting Scrum? And so the first place to get alignment, to try and get alignment with those managers that might be pushing back is, do we agree that there's a problem and what that problem is? If we are in agreement there, now we can talk about the solution. And, and we might say, we think we should adopt Scrum to solve that problem. So maybe some of the problems uh, that Scrum might solve are things like um, it takes too long to get a product to market right now and our competitors are getting there faster. Maybe it's something like we release products and it turns out that our customers don't really like them or adopt them very well. 
or whatever the problem is, right? But do we agree on what the problem is and have we made the problem visible? So the other way to think of levels of resistance is levels of agreement. Like, do we agree at level one that there is a problem and what the problem is? And it would be really interesting to sit down with some of those managers that were, that were feeling kind of abrasive at this change and say, do we agree that there's even a problem here? Because if we don't agree there, it doesn't matter what the solution is. If we don't agree there's a problem, I don't care what solution you're pre proposing to me. It's a stupid idea. Why would I waste my time on it, right? Uh, level two is, uh, is resistance that the solution you're proposing will actually solve the problem. So if we agree that it's taking too long to get products to market, and then we say, oh, well, there's this thing called Scrum, and the inventor of Scrum said you get twice the, twice the results in half the time. So uh, that, that sounds like it might solve the problem, and they might say, no, I've used Scrum in another company. It didn't do it. So there, that's an, an example of where they maybe they agree there's a problem, but they don't agree that Scrum will solve it. So can we get agreement that Scrum might be a solution to the problem? If we can get agreement there, then we can move up to level three. And level three is, yeah, we, we agree it might solve the problem, but there will be side effects. What are the side effects to adopting Scrum? Like, well, Scrum has a different set of roles. And we have a management structure that's been in place for a long time. We don't know what the side effects of adopting Scrum are. And usually level three is where we start actually getting resistance most of the time. It's either level one or level three is where we first start to hit it. And my guess is that in the example you gave, most of the resistance was around side effects. And my favorite technique for that is you probably know who you're going to get all the side effects from if you present a solution. Like you can probably think of somebody in your mind that if I propose this change, so-and-so is going to give me all the reasons that we shouldn't do it because of all these side effects. Uh, yeah, we might try Scrum, but this and our systems aren't built to do that. We don't have the capability to deliver software every two weeks. Uh, we don't have a management structure in place. We don't have anybody we call a product, on, like all of these side effects, right? And uh, my favorite technique there is uh, to go one-on-one -on -one with that person before you make the group decision. Now, I realize in hindsight, you can't do that, but you might be able to do that going forward with some of these folks and say, hey, here's the problem. Here's the proposed solution. I'm sure that you, that you know a million reasons why this is a bad idea. What are, what are some of the reasons? What are the things that will break if we adopt this Scrum model? And sit down one-on-one -on -one with them and let them tell you one-on-one -on -one, all, the, all the side effects. And then the key judo move here is as soon as they give you one, say, oh, yeah, that's an important one. How would you address that one? And boom, you just enrolled them in, in solving the side effect or addressing the side effect. And if you can get through a few of those, now you go into the big meeting and so-and-so that everybody is expecting to push back on this idea of Scrum is like, yeah, 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 I, I agree. You say, what? You agree? You never agree to these things. So you can uh, go to this as a chance to learn again uh, about the solution, about its side effects. Uh, there, are, there are a couple of other um, levels to, to the model, uh, including doubt about the collaboration of others and, and uh, doubt that uh, we have the resources to do it. Usually level three is is kind of the, the golden one. Uh, what are the side effects and can you enroll people in helping you address what those side effects might be?